Yeah, it's super funny when we when we uh, when I listen to the podcast. I'm like, I think I'm listening to a different person right now. Uh, but it's cool. It works. I get it. I understand. Yeah, I man. Five. Many facets, the same person, you know, just got to put on a little bit of a different hat, even though ironically, I can't really wear hats, you know, it's a, <laughs> that's the direction I try to take it in. How y'all brothers doing? Today? Pretty good, man. Well, welcome. Welcome to the podcast. We're, I'm so happy to have you here, man. This is going to be an awesome conversation. Um, and I, I think this is the first time that we have three Brooklynites in the house. So three like, Brooklynites. What? Quick clap for that, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> this is like the epitome of Brooklyn. We got, you know, we got a, a white Russian Jew from Bensonhurst, a black guy from, from uh, Bushwick, and a Puerto Rican from Coney Island. This is, uh, hey. this is as, as real as it gets here. That's as Brooklyn as you can get, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like all parts of Brooklyn are being touched right now. You got the diaspora out here, man. You know, it's a, it's a melting pot for a reason. We get all the different different cultures across those different neighborhoods you mentioned, man. Yeah, man. Shout out to Brooklyn. Um, so, all right, cool. Well, let's 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 jump in. Um, where we wanted to begin was, you know, Tony, you're from what I from the limited amount of knowledge I have on you from what I've seen um, online and everything. It seems very clear to me that community is very important to you and that. Um, you have found a way in your life to interact with different people, with different cultures, with different opportunities to share thoughts and ideas and differences and similarities in a really cool way. And I'm really curious to know, you know, uh, your name's Anthony, but everyone calls you Tony. And so I'm really curious to know, like, who is Anthony? Like, who is Tony before he became who he is today, where he's a mover and shaker and getting around places and stuff like that. Like, tell me about you as a kid and what your, like, just tell me a little bit about what your childhood was like and how, how you grew up before, before all the, these things started happening. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think it's a fascinating question. Who are you, who were you, and who you will be? It's kind of, things that I like to answer on a little bit of a continuum. So if I go back through that hands of time and turn back a little bit, who was Anthony Brian Vidal? Well, I will say that I was born in, as you were alluding to, the People's Republic of Brooklyn, grew up in Bed-Stuy, and uh, I came around a lot of different people while I was going through that uh, maturation process. I had the opportunity of having um, really solid role models early on whether it was my father, my mother, my uh, mentors that were my uncles or people who I would grow to know in the neighborhood. Um, I always had an opportunity to learn from different people, different perspectives. Now, what was I doing in, at uh, earlier ages? I would say that they're very similar to much, much like everybody else. I'm trying to emulate and look around at those people and try to live in that direction and see and understand what was going on. So th we're talking about, we're getting back into the time machine. We're talking about 1990s in Brooklyn a little bit of a different place, you know, it wasn't necessarily a lot of certainty, a little bit more grit, you know, and a little bit more, I'd say, danger to a certain aspect. So what that afforded me was the understanding that, you know, consequences, repercussions and things of that nature were going to be things that I had to be omnipresent about. So as I navigated through those streets and I understood, you know, I had a uh, privilege and opportunity to be in safe havens like the private schools that I went to or things like that, because those were literally the only places that weren't really war zones at that particular point in time but i always had the reality to anchor back to the real neighborhoods that i was going back to so even though i did have these nice little havens where i could dip out and not be in the midst of all the craziness and chaos i still go back and i see my family and friends that live in the projects and i gotta you know stay over here and some nights you know it was a little harder than others um but the whole time i understood the duality of two different worlds or multiple aspects of different worlds, you know? So I, I got to understand what I needed or thought I needed at that point, or my parents thought I needed at that point, was an opportunity to move past the reality that we did know. And that afforded me to go through school. In that school process, I was a, started off initially as a football player, but I can't really tell you that that's exactly where I found myself. It was just a thing to do with the guys to keep me out of trouble. I played 
in high school, was supposed to be going to college to play, but it didn't really shake out. You know, by the time you make that next big jump, you really realize that, okay, competition is going to be a little bit different on this side. <laughs> and, uh, you know, people are going to be moving a little faster. They're going to hit a little harder. That wasn't really something that I could do. And they cut the program uh, ultimately at the first school that I went to. But while I was on that path, I've always been an innately curious person. Um, and I've always been somebody who was inquisitive at heart and trying to really understand who I am was one of those questions, but really trying to understand what the relationship between the world and me was ultimately led me into that college path. That analytical brain took me into first the computer science world. Um, my first real job out of high school was computer programming, working in languages that don't mean anything today, but that's where I started. I got into a car accident. That car accident took me out of college at that point in time, and it made me have to do physical therapy. As I'm doing my physical therapy, I started to see that the same if and else statements that was true in the computer world were kind of similar to the if and else statements on the body. If I needed to make my tightness alleviate, I could strengthen another part of my body or something, something along those lines, right? It's just one big push and pull ultimately at the end of the day and it fit really well into an analytical brain. So once that spark was lit and a much, I would say, the least cost effective way to navigate through school. So I was doing computer sciences and then I completely about faced, started over again and did exercise sciences. I went into that world and had to understand the human machine, much like I understood the computer machine at that point in time. And as I'm trying to go through that, had the privilege of working uh, at the same point in time for some pretty established institutions at the very early inception of when they were really starting to get to that popularity. This is all at that point, I'd say pre first economic decline, 2007, 2006. So I'm talking highlights and heyday of where Wall Street culture was, where everybody's spending money, we're doing all the rest of this crazy stuff, you know, uh, affluence plus me being in school, plus me giving goods and services to people who are of affluence afforded me a great opportunity in which I could look into a door that I might not have known when I was back in that bed position. When I was moving around in the neighborhood, I didn't really know that this whole life existed beyond where even my parents had gone at that point, or beyond any of the people that I, I knew to define success by in some regard. So I'm getting better in school, and then I'm also providing better services, and then I'm meeting different people from different walks of life who see me innately as an investment in their success, their future, and what will make them better at a position that doesn't even make sense to me. So I'm talking about literally people who are running the world in no exaggerated circumstance. I'm talking about people who run all the Fortune 5 companies, that uh, 500 companies that you may know. I'm talking about people who are in the entertainment business, I'm talking about people who are in nearly every walk of life that I had aspirations for. And I didn't know that as I'm working on my own mastery, that mastery gets me a key to open up that door. Once I had that key to open up that door, I was able to take that and leverage it into me having opportunities to learn about a lot of different circumstances. That led to me going through, finishing my college degree. I got my master's in ex-phys, sports nutrition, all of which ultimately today is not something that I really harp or focus too much on. But what it made me was a domain expert, a sought after domain expert. And I took that expertise and I married it back with a little bit of that love affair that I started earlier on with the computer sciences. And I started navigating through a world that had not yet existed in what fit tech was. So as a frontiersman, jumped out, I worked in for, again, another couple of different uh, brands that now have really pronounced fit tech engines specifically or departments specifically. But at that point in time, it, I was screaming into the wind for a little bit. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it, it's funny to see the long arc of time versus what was frustrating in the uh, immediate instance. Because I, I, along that path, there was many a setback, many a turn, many a deviation, and many times I was told that I didn't really know what I was appraising or where I was trying to go in that position. You know, and that, fortunately, I kept forging on, kept going in the same direction, and I find myself in a uh, atmosphere today where a lot of things that were a little too avant-garde at that point in time are now kind of, you know, critical to what our current existence is. So I hope that that distilled it for you, Jesse. <laughs> I got a little bit of that essence, but you know, yeah, there's some different well, things that we can jump into. 
I definitely want to unpack some of that. So mm -hmm. the first thing that hit me that I want to talk a little bit about is tell me a little bit more about your father. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, fathers are an interesting, an interesting part to reality. And I would just really love to know more about who he was. Wh like, what did he do for work? Yeah. So my father, uh, Fernando Antonio Vidal, is first generation from Panama. Uh, um, came over uh, when he was about four or five. And at that particular point in time, uh, his fam my family uh, and my grandfather and my grandmother were forced with a very real decision. See, now we live in a privilege of having a inclusive society where you can look at me and you can say, I can define myself as Latinx. I can define myself as, you know, I'm a part of this bigger conversation where my cultural context and how I visually present to people can be really distinctly translated. In the 70s, that was not the decision. It was like, you can be black or you can be Spanish. There's this whole, all this other context that you want to have, cool. You got a Spanish name and you look black, we're going to call you black and this is what it's going to be, right? So identity has always been a complicated issue for our household and where that was going. So as we were coming up, you know, you get the different things that come along inside the 70s and again, the 80s where, you know, we, we had opportunities where we were getting make in or we were marginalized because of the language barrier, because of everything else. So we had to separate and divorce ourselves from that in, in some way, shape or form to kind of assimilate what the reality of the world was at that particular point in time. So as my dad's growing up, that's a hard household to be in, right? My grandfather immigrated over here, started bringing everybody over one by one. So it's very much immigrant culture story. My father, also in an analytical spec, uh, spectrum, also appraises the world in a similar way. He takes apart different ideas, different identities, and he goes into that direction where he was in, had an affinity for computers and computer sciences and things like that. So I definitely get that aspect and that understanding from my father. I also understand that my dad went above and beyond to talk to everybody and always find like a genuine connection to everybody. So I know I definitely appreciate and love my father for giving that to me because I, I see myself in that. You know, um, as he came along, he had to work hard, got into NYU. He did what he had to do to make every single sacrifice possible to put himself in a better position to make my life a little bit easier. So I am. This is all, I, this is all I, I hear that you have a lot of respect for your father. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it seems like you've done a lot. You've had, you've gained a lot of awareness about who he was and why he was who he was and why you are where you are today because of those attributes. I'm also curious to know, because I think a lot of men deal with this. Were you always this clear on how impactful your father was? Or was there ever a time in your life where you're like, man, fuck this guy. Like, like where he just <laughs> frustrated you or you guys, was there a point where you guys really started to bump and cause sure. you're, you're 34 now, right? Yeah, I'm 34 Is and that everything that you're hearing, if you hear something that sounds like it's clear, it's coherent, and it's a little bit more balanced, it's the benefit of having lived all 34 of those years and be able to look back and really appraise it in a real sense, right? I'm right. telling you about him right. over a long spectrum of time. Now, when we were teenagers, or when I was a teenager, sorry, and when I was coming into a different, little bit of a different world, again, remembering that story, we went from being, or at least uh, let me give you a little more detail in that, we went from being in a position of sacrifice and being at a real dire strait to having a little bit more access, a little bit more opportunity to be into that middle class kind of situation, right? So I went from living in a one bed with my mom and dad. We didn't have anything else. I was sleeping on the couch. I was in, you know, it was normal to me because everybody else around me lived like me. So it wasn't, I never felt like, oh, humdrum, what was me, whatever the case is. Uh, my dad got a better job. He had better opportunities. We changed. My little brother comes along. He grows up in a completely different household, completely different reality. Also in that story, my father, at some point in his maturation process, didn't really get a chance to grow up with my grandfather because my grandfather is trying to bring everybody from Panama over to the States. He's working three and four jobs. He's moving back and forth. And then ultimately, you know, that takes a deterioration on the relationship. Him and my grandmother end up splitting. So my grandfather, my grandfather and my father weren't in the same household when he was in his teenage years. And there's a point in time in the male maturation, at least in my point of perspective, where you have to switch from being a custodian to an advisor. When you get into that advisor role, you have to now realize that you're dealing with somebody who has different types of energy. 
So at some point in time, me telling you what to do and you, me expecting you to do exactly that is totally on par. It totally makes sense. But I'm not dealing with a, a budding man at that point in time, right? As I came into that situation and I'm getting into my perspective and I'm doing what I'm doing, you know, we, part of that teenage role is to test the boundaries. Part of that advisory role is to give you that, hey, this isn't going to be the thing that you should do. This isn't going to be the thing that we think you should do. Here's how the borders kind of keep you safe. Unfortunately, if you don't have good context for that, you will butt heads. And I'm a proud person. I'm a strong person, much like I get all the good attributes from him. I know I get the same pride. I know I'm right. And I, I'm going in this direction and we going butt heads, right? And we did, you know, ultimately I went for a period of time when I didn't speak to my father for years at, at some point. Um, but I would say I had to make the distinction. And I know we talked about this before between being right and being effective. And it's a catalyst in my life, at least when I, when I start to switch that appraisal to really start to embrace what forgiveness, acceptance, and love can really mean, you know, if I could look at the man that I see before me as my father and see the boy that was him at some point in time, maybe I can have a little bit more forgiveness for how he presented when a situation that wasn't necessarily what it should have been, you know, or how he reacted when I was reacting back in his position, right? So if I could see that boy and say, you know what, I want, what, would, what did this boy need when he was in my position that he might not have gotten? Maybe that will help my forgiveness a little bit more. What did that adolescent need, you know, when he needed to be reassured or sought after or guided in the right direction that he didn't get, that I know that's a, this is a mature version of what that is. Okay, how do I get that perspective, right? How do I put that back into context? So at some point in everybody's life, you got to realize that, you know what, even though we do have books for all of this stuff, raising a kid in the circumstances that he had to raise a kid in, and him being a kid too, because now I could think about the exact age that he was when we were having these interactions, because I lived past that age. It's like, wait a second, hold on. I know the dumb shit that I was doing when I was in my <laughs> late early 20s. Yeah, there's a reason why that sounded crazy. Oh, maybe these people who are perfectly imperfect, I still got to find a reason to love. Maybe there's something that is there that along the lines of where you know, at that instance, it didn't seem like my world, again, small world, I didn't really know how big the world is, how much context the world is, what influenced that. Okay, now, if I want this relationship to be better, I gotta take a step back, gotta get the big picture, gotta take that view and say, okay, yeah, you know what? I could be right and I could be angry and we both gonna be angry, we both gonna butt heads, but where was that gonna get me ultimately at the end of the day? So to choose to be effective as opposed to being right, give me an opportunity to mend that relationship and get back into a much better position. And I, I genuinely emote that position and I know what real power feels like in that position. So I take the softer side, I take in whatever it was at that particular point in time, none of it matters in the ultimate scheme of things, but I showed love instead of showing more force. Reserve that, right? And what did that leave him open to? He had to be accepting of that love. You can't fight, if you're standing there and you wanna fight somebody and they're telling you that they love you, you know, that's not going over the course of time. I'm not going to erode. Your, your strength looks crazy. You know, your demonstration or your need to demonstrate that is a little hard. So I chose to move in that direction, nudge that direction. And over time, we had a much better relationship as a result. That sounds awesome, Tony. And it's funny because, like, as we're all sitting here, I'm thinking about, like, hearing your story. I'm thinking about, like, my own story growing up, my father wasn't there. I don't know how old your father was when he had you, but mine was only 16. So like he was super young, didn't know what the hell he did. So he just bounced. Um, and I love that you brought in like that love and forgiveness because that's what I was able to do uh, six years ago with my dad. And it's been the best decision I've ever made in my life. Um, but I'm curious to also hear, because obviously I grew up with a single mo mother so finding those masculine figures was really hard as a young man. I, and I know you mentioned you, really quickly your uncles and your mentors that were surrounding you. So how, like, yes, your father was the central figure in your life, but where did the uncles and these other mentors come into your life to support you and where, what, you know, made Tony who you are today? Yeah, that's where I honestly had a rich bounty, to be honest with you. So my mother has five brothers that I was able to uh, piece together that. In addition to that, I grew up in a neighborhood where there was a lot of guys around constantly and I was able to 
see, you know, for, I, I was able to appraise people for the good, the bad, the ugly, whatever the case was. Now, I'm not going to tell you that everybody was doing everything in their version of what good, bad, whatever was. They weren't operating at the best of senses. But if I could take a swath from everybody that's in there and say, well, I like this person and this version of success because it looked like X, Y, and Z, or this person is really good at this other particular trait and kind of put that together. Like I had a rich male tribe around me all the time, whether it was my friends, whether it was my uncles, whether it was people on the block who was like, you know what, listen, you shouldn't be over here. This is a bunch of crazy stuff going on, on this side, but we know we can see you for who you are. You got something different that you got to do. And that's always been a story too, that I've always been told at some point in time, hey, we see you a little different. Like you can be around, but you ain't supposed to be doing all of this. Like, let me keep you on this side. Let me go in that direction. So I, I think back through the years and I've been fortunate because I've had a lot of positive male figures in my life and I've, I've gravitated toward those leaders. And I saw what that leadership characteristic was in that tribe of influence, inspiration and, and motivation. At the end of the day, you know, it, it held me down in any of those situations that weren't too certain, you know, um, or any specific instance where one of those mentors didn't really hold the space for what I needed at that particular point in time. I had others that I could look at. And yeah, I kind of sit in a weird space because I'm, you know, I'm the benefactor of a cup that that's a few generations of people influencing me. So anything that you see in that glory position or anything that could be celebrated, it, I'm the benefactor of people investing in me for whatever reason. I'm here and I'm present today because people love me people cared for me and people sought after me in times where it could have gone a different direction. And I don't have to look too far to see how far that difference could have taken me as well. Um, so I, I definitely just have a, a great appreciation for the male relationships that I have in my life. And, you know, they, they were pivotal and they, they, I still, they resonate with me to this day. Mm. I think that's, you know, I want to segue because I think that's a great place to, to jump off of. But one thing, and talk about, I think that that shows a direct correlation to why maybe community has become such an important part in what you're doing and trying to create in this world, uh, because you saw what it did for yourself. Uh, before we jump in, though, there's something that you mentioned that sparked something in me that I would love to just chat about a little bit, which is um, you said that when you were little, or um, not when you were little, when you were younger, that you would go into these places where not necessarily the best things were going on and people saw you for who you were and were like you can hang but you're you're kind of different and uh this isn't really your vibe and that's very much true to my story i i grew up where i grew up in bensonhurst it was very similar it's kind of a rough rough crowd I, I went to school in coney island and i had these experiences with 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 folks who weren't necessarily always doing the right thing, but they were also good people. They were good hearted people who just maybe didn't always have the best tools at hand. And not only that, <clears throat> a lot of these people, especially guys, um, and especially if they were a bit older than me, uh, there was a level of their ability to take risks and be violent and be that way that drew, there was a part of me that drew me to that. But then there was also another part of me that was loving and kind and way too empathetic to want to hurt somebody. And it was these two worlds that were constantly at friction of like, I just want to be, uh, I just want to be a loving, caring boy uh, and just hang out. And there's another part of me that wants to take risks and be violent and go to places where I don't want to go. And so mm -hmm. I'm curious to know, and when I was a child, that um, that messed with me a lot because I I didn't I didn't have the hindsight that I have now. It was it was mostly of like I'm weak or like these people don't accept me or I'm not good enough or like I'm afraid or whatever it might be. So I'm curious, you know, was that something you experienced and was it something else or and how did you work through that knowing that you know, because maybe now it makes sense. Maybe now when you're seeing what your life is now, it's like, oh yeah, of course I was who I was at that time. And of course, thank God I didn't put myself in these situations. But I think at that t at the time, you want to be in the in crowd and the in crowd is whatever is there. So how did you see it that way? How did you see those things? You're talking about how did I see it at the time versus how I see it yeah. today? 
how did you see it at the time and how did, and how did you come to realize what you understand about it now right so i'll say it like this the male guys g u i n c is that of in the context when i was growing up is to be stoic is to be hard is to be somebody who's unshaken somebody who is ready to be active for any one particular point in time and defend that at the behest of your own wealth and, and health in some way shape or form right so anybody asserts themselves against who i am i got to defend my i gotta get my respect i got to defend my ground i got to do all the rest of these kind of things right and there was a part of that is a part of the survival culture in the context that i was growing up in these are not things that you fight over when you're in a position of security these are not right. things that you worry about when you're in a position of abundance right i don't care how somebody looked at me i don't care if somebody stepped in my shoe i don't care if they did whatever whatever you know when i'm secure but if I'm in an environment that is in a disarray on its own, and if I'm in an environment where it is to some extent told to me that it's me versus you and told to me that I have to fight for any scraps that we do have to get, well, I have to embrace the rules of that environment. And I have to navigate for my best health in the rules of that environment and the rules of those engagements, right? In some way, shape or form, I saw that. I saw the context and I, I too were in was in that comparison culture. You know, I wanna be I wanna be with the the older kids. I wanna be rough and tumble, I wanna run around and do all the rest of this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, my mind and my brain and my my thoughts and my words, I'm a, I could tell you everything that I can tell you because I process the world and I see the world the way that I see it. So as I'm talking, people hear something, it's like, oh wait, hold on, that that sounds a little different. You're not just repeating what everybody else is saying, you you're putting something together. There's something different about this kid. This is this, this, this different. I can't be anybody other than me. You know, I'm a fucking nerd at heart, dude. This is going to be who I am, <laughs> right? At the same point in time, I was kind of a jock. I was jock and a nerd. At the same point in time, I had some real people who were doing the real things inside my environment. So I, I've seen things at an early age that took away a little bit of that innocence, right? And as that innocence was eroding, I'm thinking, well, this is just survival. This is normal. This is normalization of a lot of these circumstances. Like when I, I remember distinctly being probably like five or six when I was getting on the school bus and I saw somebody drop a gun down the stairs on the school bus. You know, I'm talking about another kid that was in front of me at six or seven. And I saw that and the bus driver saw that and the kid just picked it up, got right back in on the bus and didn't really say anything to him because yeah, that's what it was in the mid nineties. It's not a normal thing. <laughs> it's not something that we embrace and we appreciate, but what was happening at that point in time. And I don't say it to glorify it, but I say it to, this is what my reality was. I remember getting robbed on streets that I could walk past and get gourmet coffee on today, right? I'm not, it, this, is, this is my story. So to tell my story in full context, to tell you that I also was in that same position where I had to make a decision to turn left or turn right. And that could have been the difference between being here today and talking to you and not being here. So I do know some people that didn't make it all the way through. Right. So in the context of that time, I was doing whatever I had to do to get by. And I was fortunate because I had people look out for me and told me that I didn't need to do some of the things that they were doing to get further than they could have gotten. Everybody in that position, whether you were doing the best of things or the worst of things, was in a position of reaction. I was in a position of being proactive. That's a different perspective. If I'm reacting to everything that's around me, I'm not in control of my life. I'm not in control of my circumstances. I'm not in control of what that is ultimately going to lead me in the uh, direction of at the end of the day. For me, because I had that large investment, I was able to circumvent a lot of those situations that probably could have took me in a different direction. But ultimately now, I look back at it for what it is. I see, yeah, there was, there was a lot of hard decisions that people were making that I'm glad that I never had to make because at the end of the day, in that circumstance, in that context, I know what I would have had to do to move forward in some way, shape or form. And it's only by the grace of others that I was able to get past that. So I don't vilify somebody doing things out of dire need. I can't because I know good people, what I would call good people by the character and the heart of their where they go, who not who don't always do the things that we would say on a society whole was a good thing. 
but they still looked out and they still had examples. I, I, I just learned at a very early age that we are complex individuals, we're complex beings. And as the complexity comes across, life also is a big influence on where you end up going on that side. So yeah, early adolescence and going through all the rest of that stuff, I went through it much like everybody else did at that particular point in time. A lot of fights, a lot of scrapping, you know, a lot of whatever it was that was in defense of that, that state that was gonna be my own personal well-being. And, you know, I take, I take the victories and the losses all into total. And now I can look back at it and say, yeah, you know what? Had I chosen to go to that party, might have cho- it might have ended up a little bit differently. Had my parents allowed me to do some of that stuff, yeah, it might have ended up a little bit differently. You know, I might have ended up doing some stuff that I know people are still trying to get out of, you know, going into a different direction. And yeah, I'm just fortunate in that, in that, uh, in the grace of all of it. Tony, <laughs> what you're like, how you say is like how I talk to like my students. So like my day job, I work in, I, I actually like mentor and teach uh, students between the ages of 17 and 24 that kind of came from backgrounds like you and I, like Coney Island, you know, really bad places that currently live in uh, the Bay Area here in California. And our bed or Coney Island out here is called East Palo Alto. So it's like, you know, the crime rate is really high, like very similar to how we grew up. And, and I know the listeners are probably asking, you know, they think about Brooklyn as this beautiful place. It's, it's hipsterville, like all these things. But I, I, I do want to take a step back and like rewind and explain to people, because I also grew up in, in Brooklyn in the 90s. Like I'm, I'm closer to your age. Um, and I, I saw, I remember my mom was had to buy clothes that were very neutral. I couldn't wear any red. I couldn't wear any blue because of the gangs that existed. And if they yeah. saw that, they would even hurt a child. Like that's how exactly. serious it got. There were certain, like you mentioned, like there were certain people who would tell you, yo, don't come here. Like you shouldn't be here. Like for me, that was, you know, I could go to Coney Island and be like, don't go to 21st Street. Don't go to 24th Street at night. Don't walk through those streets. Like you have to stay away. Don't go to 33rd and Neptune after 9 p.m. because you probably will get shot or a bullet will pass by you. Like we, we had to grow up in these circumstances. And like, I want people to know that Brooklyn wasn't always the way Brooklyn is right now. Like. Brooklyn was a tough place. And I think it, it created something um, to how we do the work that we do now. Cause I hear the work that you do and this will lead to like the community aspect. And I really want to get into that, but like just explaining like this, and I, you've already mentioned some things, but giving people like, let me give you Brooklyn eighties and nineties where we grew up, whether that's the gun falling from the kid's pocket, going to school and with metal detectors where we couldn't, exactly bring anything in like that's how I had to I went to Abraham Lincoln in Coney Island so you know I had to this is the life that we were living and it was quote unquote normal for us but when you tell people that they're like what (laughs) you know you have to go to school like that (laughs) you if you put it yeah if you put it in anybody else's context you're talking about a war zone like like you can't go you literally can't go there's a grid that you gotta know okay this block is this is a blood block, this is a crip block, this is the Latin King block, and then we get back yep. over here neutral for a couple blocks, and then we're gonna go into the, all the different West Indian gangs and all the rest of that kind of stuff. We're not talking about, again, I don't say it to romanticize it. I'm just talking about yeah. the real essence of what we were going through, what I was going through at that particular point in time. Yeah, it was a liability to come out your house if you ain't had the right colors on and you live in the wrong neighborhood. It just was. And it was so normalized that I just didn't even associate it that with that much danger. It's just kind of like, well, okay, this is just not a thing that you do. If you're talking about it in any other context, you would be talking about, well, okay, here's the curfew that we got in place upon us. Here's where we got to move, all the rest of that. It sounds like an occupation from a, an alien army or something like that that's coming in and just telling you, you are actively present. You can't be outside past this time. You can't go on this block. Don't pass go. Don't collect $200, whatever the case is. You got all the rules <laughs> that's put in front of you and you either going to win this game or you're not. It's, it wasn't really something that I had agency on or a choice on. It, this was how I walked into the situation. I, I didn't want it to be like that outside, but what also was going on, so we're talking about the end of kind of, or coming into the crime bill, really coming into like real hard prosecution on what the drug era was, real hard prosecution on what, you know, um, uh, so many of these things that 
ended up ultimately cleaning New York City up and giving it the opportunity to be this new uh, gentrified wonderland that's kind of like, okay, this is Disney outside right now. I, I'm not, uh, all the clear and present fears that I used to have from going to some of those blocks. Now, when I'm looking at a real estate company and I'm going around, I was like, yo, that, what, what are you trying to show me? Like, what block is that? And they're like, oh no, it's beautiful over there now. Okay, it's peace. It's not even anything. I, I'm triggered by the name of the street that you told me about. But now I see that we, we've, you know, evolved past that standpoint. And, you know, part of that was the broken windows policies, grabbing people up. So I've seen the part of the cleanup too was also something that I had to live under. I've been stopping for this multiple times. I've been thrown on the floor, pocket search and all the rest of this. Cause honestly, in my eyes, police were kind of a gang too, at that particular point in time. And we didn't have cell phones to tell you, hey, the same cop that stopped me when I was going to school, the same cop that stopped me after school, is the same cop that kind of is bullying this whole neighborhood for whatever reason. And it, there is a little bit of animosity that comes across inside that, you know? It wasn't, we didn't have the ability to self-report. And even if we did, people weren't listening to that same stand, uh, stance of position. So the hardened stance came by means of survival. I have a hard time judging somebody that has to survive in circumstances like I'm describing to you and, and does something that wouldn't necessarily be the most desired result because you were trying to survive. I don't think you were trying to do anything else. You didn't have a point where you're like, you know what, let me sit and really wax wane and pontificate on the doldrums of life and where I'm going to go inside here. And you know, what's this purpose? What is, is, and how am I going to go? No, you're trying to get food, water, shelter, and make it back home safe. That's pretty much it. And it was, a, you know, for all the glory that I can look back and, and say that it reminisce on, because I, I have to appreciate the beauty and the ugly. I have to appreciate, you know, the, the thing that made me me. It is that contrast of, okay, there was a lot of uncertainty, but I knew what home was. There was a lot of uh, sacrifice that had to be made, but I never felt like I was poor. There was a lot of, uh, you know, strife, real animus, real like dangerous kind of situations. But at the end of the day, I know I was loved. I know I was cared for. So all the rest of the stuff, I, in the instant when I was like, damn, I don't got the newest X, Y, Z, and I don't have, I'm comparing myself to everybody else, you know, the young, young people stuff. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I wasn't caught up in young people stuff. But looking back at it, it was like, damn, I had everything I needed at that point in time in ample amounts and it might have even been better than having the newest <laughs> whatever i needed at that uh particular instance you know and you and funny enough you answered my second question which was like how how had that that, that experience kind of built who you are today like there, there is like people may look at it as bad but i think it's also this this goodness that was built in even like for like funny and i'll give an example it's like oh, when like currently whenever I'm at a place for some reason, like you mentioned this word earlier, omnipresent, it's like, I can hear and see everything much better than other people. I'll be in a group and I'll say like, y'all heard that? Like it sounded, was that a firework or a gunshot? Like, I know the difference, you know what I mean? Like, I know the difference. No one else does. They're like, oh, that was a firework. I was like, no, that was a gunshot, you know? Like, you know, those things, or you know when someone enters the door, whether they're dangerous or, you know, they're just whatever. But like, you know, like we need to get away from that person because they look there, there's something there. There's something wrong with that person. They came in here and we need to get out of here now. Um, there's just these, these specific attributes that were built because we grew up in this, this environment that kind of is kind of a good thing now as we have grown and, and it's brought in a lot of like, you need to be prepared for everything. You need to have your I love how you use like I also went to school for computer science so I really think my brain thinks about if and then statements like if we do mm -hmm. this then we do this if this doesn't happen then we do this and then just keep plan a to z so yeah. um I really love that you brought that up because a lot of people are just like oh my god you grew up in that and it's like yeah but it actually like it's not that bad it gave me a few gifts that I wouldn't have had if I grew up in this comfortable suburban life that a lot of other people get to experience you know and they, they yeah, get man. This, you know <laughs> yeah. so just to even elevate that a little bit more like okay because i know what real danger is you want to bring right. me danger in the boardroom no you want to bring me danger in any other like what kind of conversation i know what a real tough guy looks like you know I, i've been around that i understand where 
my life was in danger for a real tough guy. Okay, what are we, what are we really going to negotiate? Are you going to have this conversation where I'm going to be in a position of subordination? No, that's not going to be in that direction. I understand how to read somebody when they come in the room. Oh, you're not confident about what you're saying. I hear where you're coming from. You know, I could see, se literally listen to the, to the environment that we were talking about, you know, and the people who were talking through that. I'm also a hip hop nerd inside there. Separate the weak from the obsolete is the first thing that we're looking at. Oh, okay, I see where you at coming in the door. Okay, kicking the door. All right, here's where this person is. Here's how they presenting. And that calculation is happening in real time, right? And as we're going through that, I process the information nerve side but that nerve side was real close to this other side that was giving me different type of context so that is my superpower i look at both of these worlds i can exist in both of them have acceptance in both of them and they use that to go like we was talking about before going to that other the boardroom the c-level suite and i'm looking at it like you you not ready i know what i'm ready to my uncomfortable <laughs> my discomfort is a different type of discomfort than you talking about so where are we really trying to go that informs me that empowers me that emboldens me to go back and say, yeah, that same kid is now a little bit more charged up to take on whatever you call problem, because I've already seen what I call problems, and I'm not afraid of that. So amazing how that can switch like that. Sorry, Jesse, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's good stuff. Um, I think I just made two new friends together. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, uh, I love what we're talking about, and I think it really speaks to what you know, we were about to get into, which is this idea of community. And uh, I think what you're bringing up as far as the nuances of where people can grow up and what that means to them as people. And then also just speaking about your experiences. And it's funny because I think the three of us have had a similar experience where we were fortunate enough to be in highly different environments with different people. And I think one of the things that you will learn when you when you're when you're in that is that people are way more complex than uh, what may be presented based on where they're from, how they look, how they act, what what they even say. And it really at some point it really is only possible to to have that awareness by being put into those situations. And I think when people think of community at least from what i've seen it where it, it hasn't gone well is that we all agree we all think the same um and that we all we are a community because we all hold uh, the same values and i think you know right now in a world where people feel so strong uh into a community uh, or what they believe is a community because everyone around them believes the same thing and there's a there's we're x and they're y and we have opposing views that that is what community is and i think i'd be curious to know what community means to you and how do we how are you thinking about the future of the community you're from the place that you're from uh the world at, at large america these are obviously, you know, very easy questions. <laughs> and, but I am curious to know, like, as you're driving forward and, and knowing what, what having those people that loved you and cared for you and sought out for you and having all these different experiences that like, oh, I came from this world, but I also saw this world and I saw where the two connect and where the disconnect is and what's possible for people when they're not necessarily in a situation that keeps them in survival mode when you're thinking about all these things and you want to drive a community forward because on the flip end it's like yes that's that's that has its challenges and its benefits but so does the suburban life like the suburban life has its challenges and its benefits and there's uh and in all walks of life it has its challenges and its benefits and uh i i'd be curious to know because you have that awareness what is community and at, how does one build a, a sustainable community moving forward with everything that's going on? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So just to start off at the helm of it, I think that somewhere on the con of, I'll say human psyche, is the need to categorize, segment, and identify, right? But just pull it back. I'm gonna start all the way from the beginning on that. So somewhere prehistoric us, 
had to be able to see something that's dangerous, identify it as dangerous, see something that's good, identify it as good and move forward through that, right? It's a very basic concept. And when we're talking about identifying things that are inanimate or things that are, don't really have a lot of definition to it, okay, that's a cat, that's also a cat, this cat's bigger, that cat's better, like those levels of differentiation are totally fine. Until we start to look across and we see, hey, this tribe and tribe community, I'll use them interchangeably for this instance, but that tribe looks a little bit different. Is that different a danger? Is that difference a threat? Is that other creating something that I'm afraid of in some way, shape or form? So in a very basic reductionist argument, I think somewhere on the con of humanity is that conversation in trying to identify the thing that might be dangerous, the thing that might be safe, and trying to understand and rationalize how to round, you know, honestly, that square corner, right? It is a complex situation, particularly when you put in other agendas, other influences, other things that really resonate along this cultural line, this context, and what all of is true for time, right? Unfortunately, we like to take that conversation and we try to translate it in a snapshot and think that we can only use the, the tools that we have right now in that instance to solve a much bigger, much more complex issue, right? So instead of going the reductionist route, I want to take it back into that totality conversation. So what does community, what does tribe mean to me is going to be people who have shared values, shared systems, and shared beliefs that can ultimately work in synergy towards the greater good. We don't have to agree for everything. I, don't, I think it's a misnomer or a falsification that everybody in your tribe needs to agree with you. Now, we have to also be able to recognize why is that misnomer prevalent, right? What, is, what have you been told? What has been perpetuated? What are the things that reinforce the idea of what safety can be, a more conservative approach? Hey, this is safe. That other thing, that new thing, it might be dangerous. So we got to keep this on our side and we got to separate us from them, right? That's true across any of the real, I'd say, instances where we start to see this community and this sort of tribe de, uh, you know, devolving in some way, shape or form. For me, my goal with community, my goal with tribe is to make whoever comes after me have an easier route to what I can call success than I did in my maturation process. That's what my ultimate end goal is. And how I get people to around that is to recognize the human element in all of us. So even though we are different on the surface, as you started this conversation, hey, this person's from here, that person's from there. I present this way, you present that way, right? That's part of the human brain that notices those differences. I want to take it to a different level of perspective and say, well, what's the similarities here? If I can find more similarities, if I can find myself in you, it's going to be a lot harder for me to vilify you in whatever case and whatever walk you're going through. If I could take that even to a higher level and I could say, I could see, even though I don't agree with what you're saying, I could see how you arrive to that. If I can look at somebody across from me and say in that similar position, like I was talking about my father earlier, there was a point in time where the younger version of you wasn't secure for whatever it is that you're presenting to me now, right? A lot of things that people project out are not necessarily about my present state, it's about their insecurity. I know that I'm in a position where I can recognize that, right? So what you notice about me that's offending you says more about you than it does about me to me at least. What you notice about whoever, you know, whenever you're coming in and you, you can tear people down, they, this type of person does this, that type of person does that, okay, well, what about your type of person? What's going on there? What's that relationship about? And what are you really at the heart of the matter afraid of? And if I could recognize it for fear, uncertainty and everything else that allows me to do that little bit of jujitsu that I did earlier in that conversation in that story right I take that energy and put that energy right back here here's a mirror this is what you said about you how does that sound how does that go it's a much more nuanced route but as I'm shaping that community I know that I, I brought people into my life that would never be able to go through what we just finished talking about they couldn't survive that yeah, I, and much similarly, I would never be able to do what they had to do, right? I, I wouldn't be successful in that position. But if we could find that cord that is ultimately what I want to do is find that thread of humanity that ties everybody together. And yes, I notice the differences, I'm not saying divorce yourself from those differences, embrace those differences, celebrate those differences, but then get to the heart of the matter. 
we realize this tribe might be a little bit bigger than it, it was once stated, you know, and then if you can evolve your thought around that, I think it takes you a little bit further than what you might have thought community really meant and what could be accomplished in that effort towards working towards that greater good is getting more people into that tent, having a much more inclusive approach and ultimately having less partisanship at the end of the day. Yeah, I wanna really quickly highlight something that you said uh, briefly, which I think is really important for people to understand when they're talking about community, which is your definition was inherently for others mm -hmm. when it comes to community. Your, your definition was, uh, for me, community means I supported someone else or group of others to have a better chance at success or betterment um, than I had. And I found I'm guilty of finding myself when I felt like I've lacked community or have been in communities that weren't really supportive of me. It was more about what I needed and what I wanted. Right? It was it was a, the driving factor was how what am I getting out of this? How is this benefiting my life? How am I um, how is this feeding all my insecurities and needs and desires in that way? And when I did shift to a perspective of, okay, I want to be part of the community that, um, so I can show up for others, or I can show up and, and uh, be a part of something that's bigger than myself. I found a much, my life went down a much different path. And so I just wanted to highlight that. And also, I wanted now to just jump in and, so, and ask, so how right now are you driving um, a sense of community with people in your life, with people maybe on the borders of your life and, and things like such? Yeah, I try to bring everybody to the table. Now, there's also something that I'm also realizing as we go through that, you could want for everybody to be able to be around you and to be in, included in some of the things that you are doing and have the aspirations for but getting people to actualize their own potential is an individual effort that they have to resolve on their own right so i give people opportunity i say case in point the types of things that i'm doing and the the areas that i'm investigating are as you would know jesse they, they go into areas where i could have a team i could build out different uh, investigations and i could try to make people have as much access to whatever i found as, as possible but that doesn't mean they're going to do the same level of work that i did to get there that doesn't mean that they're going to do whatever it is that they might even have the great talent for, but don't have the, the resonance to show up and do the work that it would take that talent to transition into the reward that they're seeking, right? So a lot of people have aspirations for the result, but don't fall in love with the process. And as you're bringing community on, you have to really realize and be able to assess and really find the things that make people resonate around where they find, you know, true joy, where they find true purpose in that alignment between that joy, purpose, and, and passion ultimately makes it easier for, at least if you're talking about community of like doing something and accomplishing a goal, that's the only thing that I can do. My energy is going to be very specific to me. Like, and I, I motivate the way that I motivate and I create the way that I create. And, you know, I'm accepting of who I am in that role and why I can do the things that I can do. I'm not going to tell you that that's for everybody, but for everybody that is important for the mission that I think is where I'm going right now and the art that I'm trying to create right now, you kind of have to be on board for that, right? And if you're not, that's also cool. I can help be a facilitator, be a translator, be somebody who can direct wherever that energy needs to go. But I also know that as I'm being kind of like we were just talking about with Ruben, omnipresent, I also know the things that I'm not supposed to answer. I also know the things that I'm okay with saying yeah this is where my responsibility and my border and my line of logic has to end even for my community i could be a great example i could be a great leader i could be somebody who actually has great facilitation but at the end of the day the people who have to follow you kind of also have to have some personal agency so i'm embracing of opportunity dispersing that opportunity and even giving the information to have the access to execute but i know that 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 gap between actualization and execution is an individual gap to cross. So I, I allow for that to do what it needs to do in the arc of time. How do you, how do you allow yourself 
too, because it seems like based on uh, just the way you, you speak and you communicate, you like to, or you inherently analyze quite deeply on things. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to know, because a lot of times that deep, deeply analyzing things can take you away from, um, you know, whether it's a sense of presence, whether it's a sense of acceptance. Uh, so how, how do you in your own life build, build sort of a structure to have lack of structure? Because uh, it sounds like you're very structured in a lot of the, the way you approach life. Uh, but mm -hmm. at the same time, you, you see yourself as an artist, you appreciate art, you uh, create art, you know, on a daily, weekly basis. So how do you find space to let go of, of the analytical mind? Yeah, I know where certain tools serve me and where certain tools don't. I think like mastery of your artistry is really a, an appraisal of how you look at the world, right? So that analytical mind is the same mind that I use when I go to create, but my scientific side stops when science is no longer serving me. My spiritual side stops when spirituality won't serve me in that situation, right? My, my um, community side, you know, all these different appraisals of where I can exist or where I can have perspective or where I can have some kind of insight has a limitation to it. And I recognize what that limitation is. I'm not bound or uh, committed to using one particular perspective to solve every problem. I think that that is an art within and of itself. Um, for me, the street freeness of the structure is kind of like learning jazz, right? You learn all the standards and you learn and you study all of the masters to have that moment of when improv comes along. Well, my improv is going to be pulling from a lot of different stuff. You know, my improv is going to be informed by the people that in some way, shape or form, you know, laid the work down before me, but then my voice also comes through. So that's in communication style. That's in my um, any kind of visual treatments that we're putting together that's in a lot of different things. I could tell you why I think it's cool. And it's probably because the benefactor of a lot of other people that I also thought were cool. I'm just the most recent interpretation of how that comes across, you know, and I speak and I talk in a way that is, is true to me. You know what I mean? Um, so it, it sounds like it's very calculated, very measured, but this is just freestyle in my head. And that's how, that's just how I present it. And in some aspects, I do need to unplug. I do need to get, get away from certain things. And I do, you know, find that refuge when I'm not thinking. That's usually by way of why I do movement. You know, if you're really working out hard, not a lot of stuff that you could really stop and really have this real long kind of dialectic about. You know, if I am, I'm not moving enough, <laughs> you know? So that's when the movement art kind of comes in and takes shape and form. And I you know, all the things that I master in that world, you know, I like to be a brand new student. I jump into a new class. I find something that I'm completely green at for the opportunity to be humbled by somebody who knows more than me. And every time I get that to happen, you know, it's a little bit of an escape. If your brain is processing and thinking about learning something new, you're not worried about the old shit. You can't really be because you're not committed to that sentence and you're not committed to that instance. So I purposely inject absurdity. I purposely inject uncertainty and I purposely inject, you know, whatever that lust for life is going to be on the preface of the next thing that I'm trying to do, I'm trying to play it like a game, Jesse, you know, it's going to be a movie, a game, whatever. And I just know I got to win at the bill at the end of the day. I love this. Um, I, I wanted to talk about, like, I was looking at your Instagram, obviously to prep for this <laughs> interview. And I, lo I love that the first thing you have on your bio is cultural architect. And we talked about community. We've been talking about community for a lot of this, but like cultures, it's huge, especially in this day and age. Like everyone is like, this is my culture. This is what I'm about. I, I, I just moved to California like a year and some change ago. And I, I see how much people are more ingrained in their culture versus I feel like in New York, we're all individualistic. We don't, like some people are part of the culture, some are not. Like I grew up in that place. I'm not, I'm Puerto Rican, but I really don't, I, I haven't connected with my culture that much, which I, I feel like I should, but I haven't. That's the reality. But like, what does culture architect mean? Like, what are you creating besides, you know, everything that you do? <laughs> like, I yeah. feel like you do a lot, but um, I do, yeah. I do. So. 
Yeah, it's I funny. It. And I would say my Instagram is probably the worst representation of actually what I do. But you know, that's a whole nother side conversation. But cultural <laughs> architect, I will take that in for what it is. And I'll say that it's uh, an announcement that the proclamation of culture is important. And I think a lot of people who are in the positions that get into these sea level offices, and they're sitting in front of these campaigns, and they're making all the things that they think you're going to want, end up missing out on you know it, it's a it's a perspective of mine that if you don't translate whatever you're making to a culture specific context then you have a great opportunity for that to miss whatever your highest of aspiration was so in the architecture side of it it's really it's my job as a translator to understand appreciate and evaluate what is true to that culture it has a very specific context often which gets oversight and then we end up getting things that don't necessarily align with what people want and you know in the age where people can have a dialogue and i can't just tell you you know uh just do it dr uh, drink sprite and all the rest of the things that we was told at some point somebody's gonna talk back to you like actually no i don't really like that music that you put behind there like talk to me about it well instead of waiting for the reactive position why don't we be proactive i'm gonna come up with something for your community it would make sense if i actually invested in your community it would make sense if I actually understood the things that were actually plaguing this community. It would make sense that after I had this conversation, I came up with a solution that actually not only just talked to you directly, but solved that solution. And then maybe you even saw yourself in that essence of what I was trying to make. That's what that architecture is about. I'm not going to come up with a blueprint without understanding what the, the surveying of the land is and understanding what people actually do want. So I, I take that context, I translate that context, and I really do celebrate people where they are for what they are. That's what that is a reflection of. And for those who don't, right? Uh, <laughs> because right now, uh, you know, we've talked about this before, but I, I still think it's a important topic and one that needs to be iterated quite often, which is um, we live in a pol we live right now in a very polarizing world, and. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like at least in my lifetime, which has been short, but at least in my lifetime, I'm, I've am i never seen such strong generalizations and such from all walks of life, right? From all different areas and um, such strong demonizing of one group over the other uh, in, and again, when you look at history, like it's been worse, <laughs> it's been a lot. <laughs> You know what I mean? But I guess there's a sense or a feeling right now because, you know, I'm sure social media has a lot to do with and, and, and accessibility to say something without having to feel another person right in front of you. Um, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people listening who have opinions on this and feel, have their own polarizing feels on things and go one way, go right or go left, go black or go white or whatever it is. And I'd be curious to know, as someone who maybe is starting to recognize that that's an unhealthy pattern, mm -hmm. what can they do to, what can they do in their day-to-day -day life, especially now because of COVID, they're stuck at home. They can't go necessarily to some form of a town hall or go to an event or, and just communicate with others. How can they actively, um, uh, start seeing opposing views and trying to understand them, not necessarily agree with them, but trying to understand where they're coming from and why they are who they are. And, and why is it, why is that important for them to do something like that? Well, there's a couple of pre contexts that I would think that you would have to, if that's a thing that you really do want to investigate, there's a couple of uh, agreements or arrangements that you should make with yourself before going into that investigation. And I'd say this is just at least how I perceive it, but I embrace my ignorance in every single context of where it presents itself. And I say ignorance in the sense of the literal term, because I'm also a very literal aspect. It's just speaking to a state or an idea or a thing that I do not know. I also think ignorance is a curable disease in some way, shape or form. Because just because I don't know something doesn't mean that I can't learn about it. doesn't mean that I can't augment whatever comes out that end result. So if you are in a position where you can have a conversation with self and say, you know what, maybe this is my opinion, but maybe my opinion isn't a fully formed or fully baked opinion, or here's the bias 
implicit, inherent, or otherwise that exists based off of how I looked at the world and acknowledge that for what it is, then it allows you to start to go into the ways that you can investigate and go have other conversations that won't be hyperbolic because the first stance has to start with a declaration where I might be wrong. That's a hard thing for a lot of people to understand, embrace, and accept at some point in time. And that's not saying that you're completely wrong, right? But you might be wrong about at least how somebody arrived in that state that you're finding them in. That seems like it's contentious. Now, the other side is to be curious, genuinely curious, but to be free of judgment in that curiosity. So if I'm curious about learning about you, I'm not gonna judge you while I'm learning about you. Here's your culture, here's this. I'm not gonna say, well, this is bad, this is good, right? Because remember going back inside of that context, you're gonna make a comparison, right? The reminding of yourself to make that comparison, but then also to try to separate judgment out is another complicated task, right? But how honest are we when that judgment comes up, what do you notice about that judgment? What is it telling you about where you were when that made you feel uncomfortable, right? So there, there is a layer of nuanced and very deep self-questioning that you should go through first before you worry about somebody else's existence and where they're going, and where they're going, and, if, and what they are about. If it is from a true earnest place of trying to be better, you start by making the world better by making yourself better. And you start going in that direction by understanding, well, maybe I shouldn't judge people, prejudge them. That's what the context of prejudice is. I formed this opinion and this opinion is right and it's the only opinion that matters. Therefore, I don't even have to learn who you are. People are not as two-dimensional as we like to believe. There's a context for everything. Okay. If you take some time and learn and understand what that context is, it might move you into a different direction. Why is that important? Well, if we are to be a better greater society, greater job all, all along. We have to understand, recognize, and appreciate that people want to be seen, they want to be heard, they want to be cared for, regardless of what they look like, regardless of who they love, regardless of any of the other you know, things that we want to keep that separate us, that make us a part of a tribe, but not a part of the tribe. You know, if we, if we can understand that, then yeah, you have a way to move forward in that. And it takes time, it takes practice, it takes forgiveness for yourself even when you do have that judgment, because everybody does. And anybody that tells you that they don't, probably not being honest with themselves. I can tell you that in my conversation that we were having today, yeah, there's judgment based on when I'm walking into a room, I'm like, what's this guy doing? How's he moving like this? What's he, what's he got going on over here? Okay, that, that's the same prejudging character, right? But I know why, based off my survival, that makes sense. So I'm not gonna judge anybody else that's doing that in the other direction. I also have to be able to understand that me today will disarm that at some point once I acknowledge where I stand. Hopefully somebody else will be able to do that in their same regard. And if they can't, I still got to be present for me. So start with self, be honest with self, make self better, make world better. Well, I think that leads to my next question, um, which is uh, for me a difficult question to articulate. So uh, please be... Uh, uh, I don't know what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say, but you know, go please. for it, man. Yeah, there you go. Um, so, because this has been on my mind quite a lot lately, obviously, because of everything happening. Um, with, along with everything that you said, I'd love to know how you applied it to the situation. So, you grew up in Bed Stuy. You, um, you, whether you know, we talked about this. We talked about this earlier that you know, maybe at a time people would look at you and just see you as a black man. Um, there's more nuance to that and who you are and, and, and all those things. But would you, would you say that the world uh, or America at large would identify you as a black man? Absolutely. That, and I, I'd say rightfully so in the first context. It's not like I'm going to get uh, run by description. It was like there is a large 10 African-American <laughs> Latin descent individual that's going to die. No. It's not going to be the, the, okay. never going to be the case. All right. So I, I wanted to preface that. So I would, when, obviously I want to talk about the George Floyd uh, situation, mm -hmm. but, but I want to preface it with this, which is there are two opinions um, or perspectives that I've seen, uh, two really strong. Again, there's more nuance in there and I'm sure, I'm sure there's a nuanced approach you have, you've had to this. And uh, I think it's important to pe for people to hear that. 
Um, the two strong perspectives I hear is on one side, you have, um, and we look at it from an extreme perspective, right? Maybe, maybe from a very heightened public perspective. So you have like the Sean Kings of the world, which are saying that like, um, uh, uh, basically that the, uh, right now in our current state, of, of America, we're an inherently racist country, um, that there's uh, extreme oppression, uh, that cops are unhealthy, uh, police are unhealthy, and that um, it is, for the majority, it is uh, white people, specifically white men's fault for what is happening in our country, um, and that things need to be done about that. And again, I'm speaking at my edge. I'm definitely speaking at my edge. So if there's anything that I'm saying that you would like, that you would want to correct or, or specify for people, please go ahead. And then you have the Candace Owens of the world uh, who are saying that, um, uh, and you know, so on this side, you have, you have uh, the people who are viewed as we are the oppressed and then white people are the oppressors or the our societies are the oppressors and then you have another side that is saying and are, are often referred to um, in a negative way as uncle tom's or like the candace owens which is saying that uh black people need to take responsibility for their life black people need to pick themselves up by the bootstraps uh, uh, bootstraps and they need to um uh start taking ownership for what's what's going on in their communities and what's happening and that um, uh, there is a lot more responsibility than these, and that they don't see a, a racist country. They don't see mm -hmm. a racist white world uh, that the other side sees. And mm -hmm. there's groups on both ends that have very strong beliefs on this. And so I'd be curious to know, as someone who navigates multiple worlds and understands multiple worlds, where do you stand uh, on the spectrum of what is happening in Black America? Uh, and America, just America at large. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just curious to know your perspective on all this. Yeah, so I, one, just want to start by acknowledging that the factions that you speak of in Sean King and the Candace Owens, and, and, you know, those are two uh, seemingly opposing ends of the spectrum, right? And just to speak through where they are and what their perspectives are. I personally, and this is Tony Vidal, anybody that's giving you an absolutist argument is committed to telling you a lie in some way, shape, or form. That's just me. That's my personal opinion. I'd be happy to talk to them as to why I believe it's not full context inside there, right? So from that as a point of departure, the truth is always going to be a little closer towards the middle inside of where my mind goes, right? But there are two separate factions. Those are the ones that we celebrate. Those are the ones that people pay attention to. And those are the ones that get the popular idioms, right? Because they are polarizing. And if I can cause emotion, I can grab attention, right? So just as to acknowledge that for where it is and, and let that sit for a second, that there's probably truth in both sides of that, but that truth has been distorted because of an agenda in both respective uh, camps, right? So where do I see America? Where do I see Black America? Where do I see everything in that space? This is a pretty big conversation, so I'm going to take some time to, to sort through that. I would say to talk through, much like Ruben, when we were talking about uh, architecture and talk about design, if I told you I designed a bridge to do one thing, but that bridge ultimately did something other than what I designed it to do, then don't tell me what your thought for the design was. Tell me what it actually did. And that's what it was set up for, right? So somewhere along our architecture and somewhere along the founding of this country that we know today and the country that I know and I'm, I'm proud to be from and I've been around in different places, the ar architecture is built on this bias, is implicitly built on a system of subjugation. In, in every way, shape, or form, it has tertiary impact, secondary impact based off of that construction. Now, whether or not we're going to appraise it in a real sense, in a real time, and assign real cost and real uh, you know, values to what that actually did is a whole nother conversation. Because if you committed to doing that, 
you would have to likely take apart a lot of the infrastructure and that would have impact as well, right? So we are sitting in an imperfect situation, but it, we, we can't look at it explicitly. And I'd also say, I offer this, I have uh, law enforcement members in my family. I also know I've had really bad experiences with law enforcement. I'm, I'm not joking when I said I was stopped and frisked by the same cop coming back and forth. I had guns pulled on me at cops. I've been pulled out of my car. I've been in situations where I could have easily been a George Floyd and all Maude Arbery or Breonna Taylor, anybody that's in that situation. And I know it wasn't because of what I was doing actively at that particular point in time. So I, I have a very real resonance as to what was happening there, right? And I look at the work of uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates between the world and me, right? And it talks about a relationship between, yeah, I know who I am. I know what my presence is and I know what I'm trying to do. But then there's the whole context as to how the world will see me and treat me when I do present in whatever situation. And I have to understand that, yes, I might be right. I might be doing everything that I can do. And I'm a wellness person. So I know all the platitudes that make me have my personal agency and myself, you know, reporting and everything that kind of like the Candace is talking about. But then when you meet real opposition, that opposition doesn't give a damn about any of that stuff, right? Or it has an opportunity to say, yeah, you could be responsible. You could be going to school. You could be doing all the rest of these things. I'm doing everything right, but I see you as a threat and I'm going to treat you as a threat and I'm going to address you as a threat. And if that threat is heightened, I know I could extinguish you at any point in time. And I have a history that predicates that I'm going to be okay and nobody else is going to pay attention to you after putting you on a t-shirt and the news cycle goes away. Your life doesn't matter, realistically. So that's not something that I have to reach too far to understand and to, to try to have appreciation for. To look at it in terms of what we're doing now, I think people are just having that conversation a little bit more boldly than they've had it before. Because I came from where I came from, I never really had that disassociation with, no, this is a real danger. It's like, no, I, I'm glad that y'all are having a conversation, but I've, I've been here. Like, I, I never had the opportunity not to have that conversation. I've never had a, a position where I didn't think that even if I did have people in my family who are in law enforcement, some cops, certain areas, certain neighborhoods, just like we were talking about earlier, this is a threat to my existence, being here. I know it is. It's a nuanced situation. Am I going to say that everybody falls underneath that line? No. But if you benefited from that, then you also have to understand where that comes into play and why people have contention based off of this because there is clearly a system that perpetuates certain aspects, certain attributes and certain types of promotion and it disregards others. Just look at it, not for what it was intended. Like if you came here and we both came here at the same time and it was like, okay, Jesse, you and me, we're gonna go for the race. You run a little bit faster than me, that's totally fine. You got what you were supposed to get. But that whole declaration on the side of our statue, give me your poor, tired, huddle masses, yearning to breathe free, also has some subcontext. We created all, people to be equal. Not all people were considered people. We never really did what we should have done to correct that course. 60 years later, 70 years later, whatever the case is, you're going to have the fruits of those decisions be borne out. The disparities shows. It's not, it's, I don't think that anybody today is currently sitting down and explicitly trying to be out of their way to be demonstratively racist in writing of legislature. De facto, some people are you know, by a way of which that same fear comes in and they, they come up with specific laws and things to be partisan, yes. But is that inherently, is the language explicit? No, because the law says it can't be. But there's a lot of things that can have the same effect because the system was never really made to secure the people who were in the insecure position. So all I have to say, I sit in a position where I do have to embrace my own personal agency. I do have to embrace what I can do because I don't really have that much trust for somebody else to change what I see is wrong. Because I've been shown time after time that neither one of these people really do care about me at the end of the day. And my community has to be about what I'm investing in, where I'm going to go, what my direction can be based off of. I can rally around ideas, but we have to also be able to update that context too and really go into the direction of, okay, if I say that this person is absolutely committed to being a villain, being evil. How's that logic or how's that conversation different from them saying that I am less than absolutely? It's, it, it's still the same conversation. And on Candace's side, 
She's been benefited by a lot of opportunity. I also look at who is making you, why is it in your interest to talk like this? What, what do you get out of this? You know, there's always a cause and effect to even everything you're saying. And maybe she's just been fortunate enough to never have to really have that brought to your forefront and have that be something that you have to be met with. But I know that I, I, I can be in the position of, that, that's coming from a position of opulence. I can be in that position of opulence and know that when rubber hits the road, some people don't care about where you came from, what fancy words you use and all the rest of that kind of stuff. Because at the end of the day, you're other. So when that happens, and guaranteed it will, what happens then? You know, where do you go from that position? It's not a clean cut situation. It's not a clear cut scenario. Um, ultimately, I know worse conditions than, we, than what we know at, in our country. So for my perspective, we have to take, I'm trying to do the best to take what it is I was given to make it better in some way, shape or form. Other spaces t deal with it differently, but we still have a, a worldwide colorism issue. We have a worldwide racism issue. We have a worldwide subjugation issue if we really look at what kind of underpins a lot of what our democracies and our economies are based off of. We tolerate it at different levels of acceptance, but somebody's being subjugated likely to get everything that you know in your life. So how serious are we about actually solving problems would be my first question. And how real are we about being committed to unraveling the infrastructure that possibly could unravel that comfort that we also know? So for, for both sides, it seems like my interpretation when I see things, it seems like they're on both sides, people are in pain. One, one side feels like um, uh, they're being victimized. And another side feels like uh, basically that it's out of their control and there's no, and they don't feel like they're being seen and they're being heard and they're being um, uh, respected for. And so I'd be curious to know what, what message would you want? Like if you, if you had, you know, your, your, your place and your mic to share on both ends, both ends came to a rally. Uh, they, they made the opportunity, they were given the opportunity to, to coalesce and hear, hear Tony Vidal's message mm -hmm. on how to move forward uh, uh, in the, our current state. What would you say to both parties? My first message would be, I am not your role model. <laughs> um, but then immediately after that, <laughs> <laughs> embracing the fact that you are likely talking about the same thing, but not hearing each other talk about the same thing. Mm -hmm. comes back to the context of that communication and the cultural translation that needs to be happening. Because even though that seems like it's an opposing argument, again, it's, it's still based off of fear. It's still based off of uncertainty. It's still based off of largely the people in the middle are having the same level of existence. It's just whatever your tribe painted the hue of uh, that resonates the most with you makes you identify that other person is different. But if we could strip all of that stuff away and ask what people wanted and really get to that conversation, get to the root of that, that, that cause and find what their purpose is, probably is going to be a lot more similar there than not. I can't tell you that people starving in Appalachia are different from people starving in the middle of the urban cities in that plight is still real strength, right? And no, no one's better or worse. They look a little bit different. They probably think that, you know what, because this race thing is mutually inclusive and exclusive at the same time, it's a brilliant tool. So as long as I'm not them, I'm doing a little bit better, right? And then you keep that trope and it could be doing whatever you need. At the same point in time, you're still actively suffering. Suffering is not comparative, right? But it is real to the person who's there. And what do you think are some of the those things that they really want on both sides? What do you think are really underneath all of these? I think it's a, a call for safety, security, and to be seen and heard and to have value and to have purpose. I think that's what the human condition is, is driving toward in some way, shape, or form to make the your kids, your youth, whoever, have a better chance at getting further in what you define as success. I also think that people don't necessarily clearly define success. So we get caught into examples of what we think can be determinants of success, but it's usually a, a offsetting factor for what opulence is. So it's like, man, I need to have I, I need to have these material things, and then I'll be successful. I'll be happy. I need to have you know this much security. I need to have this much money. I need to have this much whatever the case is. 
it's usually a measure of something that's external that will validate and reinforce whatever the insecurities were. But often once you get there, you see that those same things are still very much still there. So if somebody can hear you for what it is that you're trying to say, if somebody could acknowledge the fact that you're suffering, if somebody could be accepting of who you are for where you are and non-judgmental, I think that's the conversation that everybody wants to have. They don't want their infringements or, or they don't want their rights to be infringed upon. And ultimately, I, I think for somebody else to make progress, if I have to take a loss, that could be viewed as a threat for a lot of people, especially when you don't have a lot. And that's kind of where the media and the, the news pundits kind of come into play and they make you feel like that loss might be a lot more real than it actually can be, you know? So there, there's the information that you take in, there's the input, there's um, the people that influence you, all the rest of these things do make whatever reality you see feel a lot more real than it might actually be. And that's a, you know, that's, that's a part of that same system too. So as we move forward into uh, the election coming up here shortly, um, you know, I've heard a lot of talk about people are afraid for that time. Uh, they find that we're just going to get more of what we've seen as far as the reaction in, uh, in our states and our cities. Uh, and quite frankly, myself too, I am, I, I've had my own nerves of like, man, how are people going to respond to this? Cause either way shit's going to happen. <laughs> you know, like either way, people are going to be really, really upset. Um, and so for anyone who's having those similar thoughts uh, uh, or who knows people who are having those thoughts, how, what, what, would, what would you wish upon people to move forward with going into this next election, either whichever way it turns out? Yeah, I, being 34, this isn't the first tumultuous uh, election cycle that I've seen. And I've seen them all be reported as the most important election cycle in my mm -hmm. life. I've already seen this happen multiple times. This is, this is vote <laughs> or die. We're going to do this. We're going to get like all the rest of that kind of stuff. It becomes a part of the machine of sensationalism in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. um, I would offer people relief by means of understanding that in my mind, anxiety comes from trying to change or alter a state that has yet to happen. So if you're really trying to figure out what is going to happen um, in a few weeks in this election and you're really actively trying to, you know, uh, prevent something from happening that you can't prevent, like, listen, you get up on that day, you go to vote, you've done your part. Outside of that, it's probably not a lot that you can actually control, right? So as soon as you stop at the border of what you can actually control, I try to find some acceptance in whatever the case may be or whatever the matter can uh, unfold into. Same point in time, yeah, we are talking about some things that are, you know, our country is not in the best of spaces, not in the best of positions. So acknowledging the fact that, yeah, there, there rightfully should be some concern there, there rightfully should be some um, hesitation as to where you would want to ultimately land or go. but if you are an active and engaged citizen and you, you've informed yourself on everything that is in the benefit of your interests and you have alignment where your interests are, vote the way you will vote and, you know, go, go forward with whatever impact has happened since then. Uh, I think ultimately at the end of the day, we fear, we fear and have hesitation on things that in the mind end up being way worse than, they actually are in true context and in true presence. Um, I am past that point in my life. So I don't really have too much reserve to, to be afraid of something that hasn't happened yet. There's two things that came up there and like you, you, this whole conversation, which is when, like Jesse said, like we were at our edge, like when we talk about this, I feel like um, anywhere you go, but it is a conversation that's happening. So I think that is a good thing. Um, and I would implore people to search. I don't know if you know about this gentleman, uh, Tony, but uh, Daryl Davis, he's, uh, he, he's well known. He's, he has two TED Talks. He's been on the Joe Rogan podcast. But he's well known for uh, having these conversations with KKK members and having them turn over their robes. Like, fascinating man. Fascinating man that I think that had, like, not a lot of people know about him. And the fact that he's even, that it was, he's even able to do that like have these conversations with those men and like be there as a black man. Um, 
I think we can learn so much for that in this day and age. So that's, that's like, like, that's something that I think people could, could go to and I can put it in the show notes for those folks. Tony, if you don't know him, I highly check him well, out. <laughs> yeah, check him out. But how did he get to that, Ruben? He's a blues player, right? So his yeah. art actually informed these people to be like, you know what? I got to listen to this man. I can't really, right. I got to soften my stance a little bit because I liked what he heard. And my bias, my ears can't hear that he's black. You know, my right. ears hear that he's, he's doing something. He's stirring my soul. And I think that's the art part of me is to get to your art to be so highly appraised that you can't, art is going to speak to you at a different level. You can't really look at it with that same, oh man, this is a black artist making this. I don't really feel that. No, that's not what the world runs off of. You know, this is the thing that's going to make you tap your feet, move your head. This is going to get into that, that what, what a Cornell West would say is soul stirring music. Then once you get unsettled, and you get provoked, you have a catalyst that sparks your mind in a different way, you can't turn back around. So that, that would be my invitation to the true artist. Now is the time for us to make our best art. Now is the time to push that envelope in a different direction and maybe do the work that we can't do in politics. Maybe do the mending that we can't do by means of your civil servants or whoever. You know, the artists will get people to come together in ways that not a lot of others can. And I'm talking artists across a wide spectrum. It's not just the music, it's the food, it's the movement, it's whatever the case is. That thing that is your culture that you take to the highest possible level and you play it in that level of brilliance where you don't even know where it's coming from, you do that the best you can and you bring a lot more people to that table. Thank you for saying that, Tony. That's what we need to hear. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as we close out here, I think, Jesse, you got one more question. Um, as we, as we're closing out, uh, well, obviously I want folks to know you have this awesome podcast off the strain. <laughs> I was able to listen to at least an episode before we jumped on. And right. I just, well, number one, it's amazing how there's three of you with the guests. I'm, I don't know how you do it. I'm like, as you add more people, I feel like it gets harder to podcast for your <laughs> conversation, the way it's like, it flows so naturally. I love that there's this like Brooklyn in there, like the way y'all talk, like we're very like, I, right now, the way we're talking is not how we normally talk. I'm sure, like, there's this Brooklyn to it. We have this, like, little accent when we normally talk, and we're, like, out of this this space. And I love to hear that. So um, big ups for that. I don't know. I, I would want to hear what else you're working on so the folks will know, and they can kind of, like, check out who is Tony Vidal and where they can find your art and everything that you're working on. So I just kind of want to, like, throw that back to you. Like, where can folks find you? Yeah, so off the strength underscore is where we have the most up to date uh, post on IG. That IG looks a lot better than my own personal one because I actually have somebody else navigating that. You know, that's a <laughs> that's a, a trial by jury on that side. Um, and you're exactly right, Ruben. It, it really is. It started off as just an outlet for me to have that unique expression and that unique conversation because I do think people who are leaders in this industry are unique and, and interesting individuals that if you can motivate kind of similarly to the point of departure in my early story, if I can give somebody confidence who's literally running one of the biggest companies in the world and I can make them feel like they could do something that they couldn't do before, what would that sound like if I could translate that to people who came from where I came from? How many more people can I move in that direction, right? And how, how would it need to sound for somebody to actually pay attention to what it is that I'm saying? I'll give you all the fancy words you want, but what good do my words do if they, people can't understand me? So if I'm trying to translate it to people who I came from before in the context that I need, it needs to have a bass, needs to have some rhythm, needs to have a little bit of percussion, it needs to have a little bit of comedy in the discussion that ultimately ends up being something that is a little bit more nuanced if you listen all the way through. So I'm here to entertain, inspire, and ignite that, that curiosity in the next generations that come across um, off the strength is one of those projects i also do some projects with a couple of different apparel companies um, i've done a couple of campaigns this year you know there's there's things that i'm in the midst of working on that i can't quite speak to this yet but know that it's all in the direction of proliferating and elevating who i think the true movement artists are and my ultimate goal there is to do to movement culture would um like uh, the likes of an anthony bourdain did to food culture so i want to be able to take this movement display this movement and show you where all of the different cultures intersect because we all at the end of the day need to move as a part of this human condition in some way shape or form so the better i'm able to dissect that able to, i'm able to translate that it's going to look a lot of different ways i'm put it in a lot of different contexts this was the first of many that is going to come down that line 
Uh, and we didn't even get to all that. So <laughs> this was such a like dynamic conversation. We didn't even get to movement, which is something that we're all super passionate about. Like, you know, yeah. Jesse and I doing the Spartan race soon. Like we didn't even get to that. So hopefully we can do a, a part two, whether that's here on Hidden Health or with you on Off the Strength and talk about like that in, in true, like everything. Like let's talk about movement because oh, I'm, yeah. I'm with you on that. <laughs> For sure, I'm with that. But that's also why I do off the strength, because we, we can be complicated people outside of what I do. It's off right. the strength. That's, <laughs> that's where it's at. Now you're getting it. Connect you, baby. <laughs> Oh, this has been awesome. this has been awesome, Tony. Thanks so much for doing it. And you know, one thing that we also want to quickly mention is obviously Portal. That's how you and I have even got a connection. Uh, we'll leave it in the show notes as well. We are building a humane technology for community and wellness, and it's going to be freaking awesome. Our alpha is out right now. You can go check us out at portal.com, and uh, links will be in the show notes and all those good things. But uh, Tony, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your wisdom, sharing your 34 years of nuanced experience. And um, uh, it's been a pleasure, man. Thank you for having this conversation. Thank you for having me on, guys. It's been a pleasure. I can't wait to talk to you again. Yes, sir. Thanks.